Hello, and thank you for exploring Lakehead International's videos. My name is Jordan, and I am the International New and Social Media Officer. I'm also the host of the Lakehead International Live series, a fun and informative way for you to connect with current international students, professors, and ask questions about admissions and everything Lakehead. You are about to watch a recording from one of our previous live sessions. If any questions arise throughout the video, please do not hesitate to comment below. If you would like to check out some of our upcoming live sessions, please head over to our website at lakeheadu.ca forward slash international dash live. Let's begin. Thank you very much uh, for, for tuning in and, and listening uh, to something that, as I said, it's uh, an expertise that I have, I suppose, from re researching climate change, but, uh, you know, got to spend the last year also contemplating where we're at in life and, uh, and the relationships between the two. I mean, clearly, uh, we notice climate change when there's large events, when there's an uh, increase in severe storms or uh, heat waves, and we notice COVID when it, when it dramatically affects uh, ourselves or our lives, but we often don't notice these uh, types of problems uh, when they're not affecting our direct lives, uh, and, and, and it's essentially the nature of a, a systemic long-term problem uh, that we need to address. So there are important and shared challenges uh, between COVID-19 and climate change uh, in the sense that we consider them a crisis and how we respond to them in, is a very reactionary way rather than built into our, our social and environmental systems. Certainly we know the impact of social restrictions has reduced our consumption, it's reduced our mobility, uh, it's reduced our ability to go out and consume in a very consumption-driven society and so that has resulted in uh, decrease in emissions, whether they be CO2 emissions or carbon emissions that increase warming in, in the atmosphere or pollutants themselves, which are also part of a climate change that we don't often consider. So these awarenesses aren't just interesting uh, and, and important for our own life and sense of meaning and, and how we uh, cope with life, but they have important lessons for policymakers. Um, and, and the problems are are wicked, as some academics would describe it. They're very difficult to manage. They're very counterintuitive because the science that we rely on doesn't give us always a conclusive answer on what the nature of the problem is and how to address it. And so we do that in both climate change and COVID. We debate the facts, we debate the science, and we have a lot of distrust in our society because different value systems are playing out under a common risk. Um, so in this short PowerPoint uh, presentation, I want to discuss just some of the similarities, some of the similarities that have been proven, as well as some of the similarities that are theoretical or, or based on our intuitive know knowings, and how this has lessons for the future. Uh, clearly, in both cases of COVID and climate change, early action, forethought, and trust in each other and trust in science are key to facing these types of emergencies. Uh, and so COVID and climate change are simply early warnings, perhaps of, a, of, a, of an ecological crisis or a direction that we're going uh, that doesn't provide the balance we need for, for sustainability. So uh, the Harvard School and the Environment created a, a workshop for a number of academics just to see what types of questions people were asking when it came to climate and coronavirus. And this might have been triggered about a year ago by the then United States president who, when posed with the question of how to deal with coronavirus, simply said that during the winter, the numbers were rising, but by the time summer gets here and the warm weather is here, the coronavirus will be gone. Uh, and that triggered a lot of academics to explore the linkages between you know, our outside environment and COVID transmission, as well as a changing climate and what that means for future viruses and, and, and future transmission, and, and just the nature of where the virus comes from. Uh, is it a human caused uh, problem in the sense of how we treat the planet? Uh, much similar questions we have with climate change. So does climate change affect the transmission of coronavirus? What about air pollution? Does it increase the risk of getting coronavirus or does it make the coronavirus symptoms more worse? Uh, will warmer weather slow the spread of coronavirus and how likely are we to see infectious disease spread as a result of climate change? What are emerging infectious diseases on the rise? Or why are they on the rise? And what actions can we take to prevent future outbreaks? 
Uh, so much more than just a COVID climate change link, but these are representing future trends. And we do see increases of viruses in warmer regions around the planet. And then from the human perspective, what about the people that are at risk? We often look at climate change or viruses as if they affect people equally, but people's social and economic and political place in the world uh, either allows them to be less exposed or more exposed to the outside world. Uh, so do we know the communities at risk and are we really addressing communities at risk to reduce impacts versus always trying to stop uh, the particular crisis or climate change or COVID? You know, we like to fight climate change. Uh, we like to fight the virus and the pandemic, but we rarely look at helping uh, and healing the parts of our society that are most exposed to any impact. So health officials have been starting to get more involved in climate change as it relates to human health. Certainly heat waves uh, caused by climate change do uh, create a concern for health officials, uh, waterborne diseases, or any way that people's uh, health amplifies an impact make health officials key uh, knowledge holders and managers in the response to climate change, just as we see their strong uh, place in the pandemic. So should we be looking at what we're doing in climate change adaptation and global health policy and find the common links? Are they caused by a similar root cause? Uh, we know that COVID-19 causes a high amount of death. Uh, and indirectly, we know that changes in climate, whether it be through aridity or famine or lack of water uh, or disease, causes death also. So why are we handling these two problems drastically different? Um, and, and I think in the, in the, what we'll be facing with COVID is a long-term awareness of viruses uh, and, and the ability to uh, reduce virus uh, transmission, uh, but the cost will be much different than simply vaccines and short-term emergency responses. And that's very much similar to climate change where we often debate is climate change adaptation really worth the, the funding uh, and the money, and what are the compromises that we need to make to our lives, to jobs, to the economy, to address some of these environmental and now health-related concerns. So we don't have direct evidence that climate change is uh, affecting uh, COVID, but we have some indirect correlations. So for example, you know, the spread of COVID is believed to be from uh, exotic species or the interaction between people and maybe rare species that normally wouldn't be in human settlements. And certainly in the Amazon rainforest, the large destruction uh, of, of Amazonian rainforest into first uh, cleared fields for forestry that then were turned into agricultural land for growing food. And now the trend is to grow, take those agricultural crops, which are less profitable than perhaps pastures for cattle and turning those lands into cattle farms. And what that does obviously is not only reduce uh, the, the complex um, old growth trees that absorb CO2 and release oxygen and, and really create a competitive environment where disease transmission is, is isolated. Uh, and, and not only does it uh, decrease that process, but now you've got very homogenous or similar land types uh, dominating space, bringing people closer to uh, these, these ecosystems. And then some of the, the vermin or the animals that end up living in pasture or crops are often uh, homogenous as well, or, or a rat species or a mouse species. So rather than 50 or 60 diverse different species in, in one parcel of land, you have uh, you know, a, a population of rats that may exist among cattle. And that transmission now of disease is carried by the rat to the cattle or to humans themselves if they're on that pasture. You can see from the bottom right location where we clear in the Amazon along tributaries also allows for virus transmission through waterways uh, or where people are using waterways to get to various inside reaches of the Amazon where it's being cleared further, bringing us into contact with exotic species and so forth. And so we really have to appreciate, if you look at that diagram of the tree, you know, there's a number of processes going on uh, where, the, where the forest through trees and through nutrient uptake are respiring and, and creating oxygen for the planet, but they also create this very protective and competitive environment to reduce disease transmission. 
you also have the the the, uh, the fact that as you clear rainforest, animals move uh, away from these areas and further uh, collect in in areas that may not be able to deal with virus transmissions themselves. So there are some indirect correlations, at least with human activities affecting climate change through forest destruction as well as uh, uh, increasing uh, virus transmission. And of course, the more animals are threatened, the more they become exotic. And so we have a, a very interesting trade of exotic animals on the planet. Uh, so when something's endangered or threatened, albeit from forestry, uh, clear cutting or human activities, it further amplifies this trade of animals to a unique group of people. And again, that exposes us to virus. So some interesting links there uh, in, in the sense of if we were to reduce deforestation of the Amazon, if we were to value its properties uh, for climate, uh, it would have subsequent benefits for reducing or buffering us from virus transmission. Awesome. I have a question from an audience. Sure. Uh, of course, as you mentioned, sort of the focus on the Brazilian Amaz Amazonian rainforest, is this deforestation or this cultivation of pastures as well as crops happening significantly elsewhere in the world also? Certainly, uh, rainforests across the planet under, are undergoing the same stress. Uh, the desire for forestry about 10 years ago came from a reduction in forestry in the West or in North America, and that increased the price or the ability to get a good price for these large, fast-growing trees in the Amazon. So now companies could go there, exploit forestry in any Amazonian or rainforest, sorry, rainforest country, uh, and then it was simply the land left over that then was converted into agriculture. But the Amazon is the key area that this is happening. It's the, it's the easiest place where governments right now are very friendly to development. And that's where the majority of this research uh, is done. But certainly in Indonesia and around the world, I think the same principle would apply. Awesome, good to know, thank you. So there is studies on other viruses like malaria that show how deforestation leads to increased transmission of malaria. Uh, there's two different types of malaria here shown in, in, in figures B and C. And, and figure A basically shows you that most of the rainforest in the uh, interior region of, of uh, the Amazon is where malaria would exist or where you, were be, you would have been more likely to contract uh, uh, the virus but through deforestation and the increase in settlements on the outer end of the, of, uh, the Amazon basin, there's a, a greater transmission now of malaria into those regions. So obviously more population means more uh, occurrence of malaria, but the deforestation puts people uh, much, much more into that Amazonian basin. So you can see the level of deforestation in diagram D starting to uh, move into that interior uh, region, and then subsequent reduction in forest cover. So there is an interesting uh, trend that's happening where uh, the increase in deforestation leads to malaria, and then the increase of malaria has a response by reducing the amount of deforestation that there is. So there's a human response going on uh, uh, in reducing uh, uh, deforestation because it's now providing people with a protection from malaria. So going from deforestation to, to anti-deforestation as a measure to reduce uh, malaria transmission. And you can also see from figure F, there was a correlation with the increase in aerosol pollution from activity in the Amazon. And I'll talk a bit about how pollution, aerosol pollution further affects us, uh, obviously weakens our immune system, especially to respiratory viruses. And just a note on in Canada, uh, where we are here at uh, Lakehead University, there are uh, climate models that show over the next century that you know, our ecosystems are shifting, not just from deforestation, but from a shifting temperature. Canada is very dominated by a cold Arctic air in the wintertime, and that creates, as you see on the present day diagram, a very horizontal or latitudinally structured uh, vegetation zone or ecosystem. It's dominated by climate. Uh, as increases in climate change affect Canada in particular, which is a cold country, but it's warming much faster, the ability for growing seasons to change and species to grow in different re regions does open up opportunity for resource extraction, but it also means that things like waterborne diseases, uh, diseases carried by mosquitoes, things that the cold used to uh, reduce, now open, open us up 
uh, to different interactions in the far north and the potential for virus transmission. So it's not just the Amazon where this potential correlation can exist. I have so that, question. Yeah, go ahead. Please do. Uh, it says, uh, could it be that as ice melts because of the climate change that it releases trapped ancient viruses that could be similar to COVID-19? And I know that this actually question has been phrased in the news and to many people across the world. So I'm interested to hear what your uh, take on it is. Yeah, certainly the increase in melting uh, uh, glaciers and ice caps, but mostly glaciers, you know, and in, in, in found in mountainous areas where urban environments exist. And we tend to benefit from the freshwater systems that come from glaciers. Uh, so certainly, uh, since these glaciers haven't undergone rapid uh, warming in thousands of years, perhaps 50,000 years, it does lend the idea to ancient viruses that have been locked up in, in those uh, glaciers now being presented into the water system, into river systems uh, at a far higher rate than, than in the past. There isn't a lot of research showing that there's a transmission to humans or that these ancient viruses could live and exist and flourish. It's, a, it's more of a theoretical basis, but it's built on a logical correlation that we know that there are viruses trapped in cores of, or in layers of ice, and that ice is melting at rapidly high levels, especially in the last decade. Awesome, thank you. So that, that's, that's sort of a, a little bit of information on, on on the aspect of climate change, which again is the heating of the atmosphere from CO2 or carbon dioxide trapping in long wave radiation. But climate change is also related to pollution, aerosols in the atmosphere, which are important. There is a certain amount of particles and aerosols in the atmosphere that make up atmospheric chemistry. But uh, certainly as we release emissions of any type uh, into the atmosphere, they can be suspended and in urban areas in particular cause more aerosols than, than uh, ecosystem balance. And then that has effects on our respiratory uh, process. So uh, pollution is a factor. Um, this study here first shows that there is a correlation between COVID-19 and some of the basic variables of climate. So not just climate change, but the, the actual variables uh, that we measure to understand climate. Climate's the long-term average of weather conditions. So things like humidity of the air, the moisture in the air, the air quality itself, uh, rainfall uh, amounts and frequencies, the, the highest and the lowest temperatures and the temperature average and the wind speed are all factored into how we think of climate. So climate change isn't just warming, it's a, it's a dynamic feed of all of these variables. And so this study just came out of New York City, which was the most hard hit American city about a year ago uh, in the pandemic. And they found correlations with these variables. So for example, there was a correlation with areas of increased solar radiation. So if you have a lot of hot sun, or if you're near the equator or your areas where you get more solar radiation in the day, that solar radiation does reduce the, the particulate matter of uh, transmission virus from the, from the air. Uh, so in an arid environment like the, the desert regions, that principle would apply. However, when there's a lot of solar radiation in a moist environment or an environment where there's a rainforest or there's moisture, that moisture goes up into the air and creates humidity. So be, uh, being in, a, in an environment where there's a lot of moisture in the air and you're perspiring and you're breathing uh, allows for the transmission uh, of viruses more because that virus can hang in the air during humid times. Obviously, wind is a negative uh, um, uh, factor on transmission. So in a high wind environment, you're, below, you're you know, outside, you're less likely to, in social interactions, uh, transmit a disease. So it was a really interesting study because although these are small factors, I mean, if you're hanging out outside with a friend and you're, you know, you're, you're together and one of you uh, has a virus, it can be transmitted regardless of these factors. But when it comes to sort of combating COVID, and we're trying to think of different social restrictions or measures that we can take to reduce the spread, the, in the long term, these factors can be part of that, at least for different regions of the globe, uh, and what it means to socially distance outside if that should be the case. So again, a small um, correlation, but a correlation nonetheless, and people are thinking outside of the box here when it comes to how to reduce transmission other than just you know, one-off one solutions. 
This is a study that came out of Harvard University that showed a direct correlation between people who had respiratory problems from air pollution and mortality rate with COVID. So this was a fairly significant study. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, studies on, on uh, particulate matter and aerosols in certain particular in environments like uh, New York City or in small scale environments, but this data was available across the United States and they simply correlated or found a strong correlation with mortality and then exposure to air pollution. So that has a lot to say uh, about how we address air pollution and COVID together. So for example, uh, measures to reduce air pollution, which of course are part of climate change adaptation could very well relate to reducing the symptoms of COVID, which is again, part of uh, uh, reducing the spread and reducing uh, the, the impact of it. So this diagram here, it's a little messy, it's all over the place. It's just sort of a brainstormed idea of showing, you know, we need to ask more questions about how does airborne transmission of viruses take place? What factors are controlling them? You know, when it comes to flattening the curve, are we just staying home or are there ways that we can go out and interact and be risk averse in certain environments? Like if it's a windy day, perhaps people are more comfortable to go outside and play or be closer in a soccer field than uh, if it's a dry or sorry, a humid day. Um, but so these questions are really starting to link air quality with society, with public health and climate. And that means it's complex. It's challenging, but the range of solutions increases. And then is this common worldwide? Is there something at the international level that would prescribe different measures based on the geography of where you live? And I think what's most important about it is if the, in the bottom uh, diagram here, uh, the more horizontal one, you know, we, we have a, a case where pre-lockdown emission rates were quite high. These are a number of, uh, aerosols and greenhouse gases that we emit into the atmosphere from human influences. After lockdowns, we see a significant decrease in these emissions. So once we restore society or once we learn about how we can deal with the virus or reduce uh, the impact, how do we go back into a world where we hang on to some of these emission reducing behaviors? Because of course, over time, the, the concern is that we all just go back to life uh, and, and, and that doesn't just affect our ability to deal with future viruses, uh, but it, 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 uh, we lose ground on the efforts we've made to reduce emissions that some researchers think are far more deadly in the long run to human society uh, than, than just a concern over viruses themselves. So here's a good example, and we'll have a poll after in a sec here when I talk about it, but just, just to give you an, a, a, two snapshots, one from Los Angeles and, and one from New Delhi in India of, of many images that you can find online, incredible images if you go to education sites, particularly ones that aren't doctored, uh, of just the pre and post COVID uh, smog, the amount of, uh, of pollution that's in our atmosphere from driving, from buildings that emit emissions um, and so forth. Uh, and, and, and you can see that radical difference. So if there's a correlation between respiratory illnesses from pollution uh, and COVID severity, uh, then certainly our social restrictions have done a tremendous amount to reduce that amount of emissions. So just a quick poll here we've got here, uh, got out. Have you noticed a difference in your local air quality? And I think it applies more to people in bigger cities, but you know, I live in a city that has a, a pulp mill in it, and I've been to smaller cities that have pulp mills, and sometimes the, the lack of production in those uh, industries from having to reduce the workforce uh, in them has decreased the amount of uh, pollution that, that's noticeable to regular people. So I'm looking at the poll here, uh, and as the numbers stop, and I'll let people put more in there, but you, you can see since the beginning of the pandemic, 72% of the people listening have noticed a change about 2%, uh, 11 percent uh, haven't noticed and about 16 percent unsure. And as I said, you, you would notice this more if you're in a major urban area or, or in a country that has maybe uh, less air quality restrictions uh, for development. Awesome. So we'll, we'll give this another maybe 10 seconds here and then we'll wrap it up on the poll. Uh, very interesting to see, of course, though, sort of the vast majority of today's audience agrees that they have noticed a difference in their local air quality. And so as uh, Dr. Stewart mentioned, sort of that connection between lowered emissions from industries and during those lockdown restrictions and how that's played a role.
So I'll end that poll right there and share the results with everyone. Um, the, the yeses win in this case, there's 17 folks on today's webinar or 74% of you agreed that your local air quality, you have noticed a difference. A few of you unsure and a few said no. Um, I'll, I'll let Dr. Stewart sort of make inferences based on that. Yeah, and I think when I ask people around Thunder Bay, for example, where I am right now and where Lakehead University is such an amazing environment, we have we do have such a, a clean uh, air quality and we live by a really great big lake. So it's not something that's a common awareness for people around here. Um, but it, it's interesting to see that the theories the, that academics are coming up with and the small studies that prove the theory has merit is also validated by by people. And that's really important in this discussion. You know, we have to recognize that science never has been a conclusive uh, machine of answers. It's been something that allows us to view the world uh, through, through technology in some cases, whether it's a microscope or a chemical test or a, a satellite or, or a telescope. We're simply looking at the world and recording it so that we can share it. Uh, so science is always up for errors and questions. And uh, in this world of, of climate change and COVID pandemics, you know, I think the most work we need to make as a society is to harmonize our intuitive notions and, and, and create some trust for what we see in the world. Always a careful skepticism, but to trust that, uh, you know, that when, when we commonly see things in the world together and we witness it, uh, much like traditional societies, that's a, that's a good uh, inkling of, of how we should act and how we should behave, especially if we're being careful uh, and precautionary. We have another little poll here coming up too. So the other interesting thing, and you might have saw this right at the beginning of the pandemic, but within a month uh, into May, I'm talking the global pandemic, uh, the, the, the social restrictions just from people staying home, stay at home orders, uh, led immediately to a tremendous amount of wildlife finding new spaces. You know, they're out there. Uh, and it really shows you how wildlife uh, stay away from human uh, settlements. But once people weren't hustling and bustling in the city or in the outside edges, particularly, there was an increase of wildlife. Uh, you can see in the bottom left image, a puma in Santiago, Chile, right in the downtown. And, and you know, if you, you know anything about cats, uh, wild cats, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're very, uh, uh, they're, they're able to maintain their cover very well and be in your presence without you knowing. And so this puma felt comfortable to come right out, maybe find some food or something uh, in an environment that was less noisy, uh, you know, less vibrations on the ground and less people. Uh, to the right, there's a, a dolphin in Istanbul. Uh, this was, you might have heard of dolphins returning to, to the canals in Vienna simply from the lack of pollution, from a lack of tourism, direct pollution into the river every day that limited life from existing and, and dolphins from sp swimming up. In this case, in Istanbul, uh, the dolphins came back simply from a reduction of all the motorboat traffic uh, and the vibrations and sound that you would imagine from from that activity. And then the larger image, which is just very dramatic, is a, a wetland in India. Uh, this is a wetland that has been known to be quite polluted. Wetlands do absorb uh, pollutions well because of uh, this low lying drainage from this urban area. Uh, and within a couple months, uh, the decrease in pollution and the dec decrease in activity allowed for these flamingos to repopulate this space that they had traditionally used. And it was something that people you know, the bright pink colors of thousands of flamingos had never seen in this region, uh, at least not in recent times. So the poll that we've, we've got up, again, a little bit different one. Uh, I guess we'd all have to be out of our homes uh, in some cases to go out and uh, witness uh, animals in our, in our surrounding. But did wildlife return to your local city during extended lockdowns? So we, we still have a yes uh, as a uh, as a large factor in the yes or no, but there's a lot of unsure people, which I, I think is to be expected, but a good, good example of, of valuing that unsure uh, number. Uh, you know, when you have a poll like this, we, we always want to jump on, is it a yes or no? But in this case, you know, we've kind of got so many people unsure that it, it wouldn't necessarily make a valid survey, uh, but at least it does show that there are people that are noticing this phenomenon uh, versus those that are not. Uh, uh, on that note, I was I, I wanted to pose the question to the audience once again to those 10 folks that said yes, that they have seen a return to the wildlife. If you feel comfortable sharing sort of 
what animals return back to your city environments or to your local communities that you typically would have had to you know, travel or at least be exploring out in the wilderness essentially to see them. I'm curious so, to know, so let us know in the chat. Uh, and then as they roll in, I'll be able to feed those in eventually. So at that point, I'll wrap up the poll. I'll share the results with the, the broader audience so that everyone can see the full numbers there. As Dr. Stewart mentioned, we had um, quite a few yeses, 10 folks, 37%, a few no's, uh, 22%, and then uh, a large number also that were unsure. So whether that was because you were truly following that, that stay-at-home lockdown order and you weren't able to see those animals or you just weren't sure, um, here in Thunder Bay, we're very fortunate actually to have sort of wildlife and animals integrated quite regularly into our city environment. You'll see them all over our Thunder Bay campus, as well as our Aurelia campus has opportunities where animals will come right onto our campus communities. Uh, so it's a, a familiar thing to see those wildlife with us. Uh, but in those larger city centers, especially maybe the, the main photo for this example is a massive city center in India and welcoming thousands of flamingos back. Awesome. So I'll stop sharing those results and pass back to you, Dr. Stewart. Sure. Yeah, so it, it just raises questions as we venture back outside. Uh, you know, how do we want to enter that space again? You know, I know, as you, Jordan was just saying, you know, the fact that animals come on campus in, in, in Thunder Bay and uh, Aurelia campuses, you know, this is this is something that we value. You know, of course, we're cautious about the, the ones that are a little more predatory in the sense of keeping distance and having people, uh, you know, warning and, and so forth. But it is a valuable component, it makes us feel good about living here. And, and so I wonder if uh, as we enter the world, if we'll look at wildlife that way versus the traditional view of it being vermin or things that disrupt our uh, nice, clean societies or cityscapes. How can we reincorporate and revalue uh, this so that we fight for it or so that we manage for these things? Uh, and that could be through environmental policy and valuing environmental policy differently than we had in the past. Awesome. We did receive one comment from a student from India that said, according to the news, uh, dolphins actually return to the Mumbai shores. So hmm. very interesting to hear, of course, Mumbai is a major city center within India. And so I would imagine that the shores uh, would be filled with people typically, you know, enjoying maybe a relaxing day at the beach or a vacation of some sort or plenty of commercial fishing activity over there. But to see those dolphins return, uh, that's great to see. Yeah. I just noticed we got off to a little late start. Jordan, what, what how much time do I have left just so I know what going into the... Um, I would say maybe about five more minutes and then sure. we can move into the Q&A. Uh, I'm happy sure. to sort of filter in more questions though and then maybe we'll shorten that end period Q&A. Okay. Yeah, I just have one, one more section after here. Uh, you know, it's important to notice in addition in the city environment, uh, that the you know the, the response isn't just from air pollution. This graph is just showing you a percent change in activity, and it's quite dramatic. Uh, so if we look at different sectors as an indicator, right? If we're always trying to find just indications of trends and correlations, certainly not conclusive. But I think most people, uh, if you would have seen this graph before the pandemic, all of these uh, different sectors—the power sector, the industry sector, surface transport or driving, uh, residential, our homes, and and what we use and the aviation sector uh, would have all been uh, you know quite large emitters and in this case since the pandemic there's been a dramatic change in activity uh, in each one of these so you can see city congestion country mobility two big factors in the release of co2s in particular and then that overall when you look at through some of the country examples that overall world country impact so as a globe you know this is the first time in history at least that we've documented or we're able to monitor dra drastic changes in our consumption our industrial output that led to reduced co2 and we you know we, we've seen this in the past in the sense of uh, during 9-11 in uh, 2001 when air flights were restricted uh, at least around North America uh, for two months after after the tragedy, you know, there was a significant decrease in, in contrails or uh, aerosols in the atmosphere from uh, from uh, airplanes and a reduction in heating from from trapped uh, um, radiation from the earth from in the, in the climate change effect. So we it has happened in the past, but quite an interesting bit of evidence that as a globe, you know, living on one living planet, if we all act in, in a similar way, we have this subsequent 
improvement in the health or in the conditions on the planet. So let's move just into the end here on what we do with this information. Again, this is these are theories that are being backed up by evidence. I'm talking to you about them in the sense that I'm, I'm feeling the belief in them or I'm feeling that these are credible knowings about the world. Uh, but what do we do with these knowings when we start to draw correlations like this, other than sometimes debate and wait for more and more science to prove one side over the other? Uh, that doesn't work in society. So what we need to recognize about these incidences, whether it's climate change or COVID-19, is that they're high momentum trends. They don't always give us impacts on a daily basis, but they're moving fastly. They're changed. The, the issue itself is changing. So climate change has increased dramatically over the last 20 years. Every year of the last 10 years has gotten at least hotter or has been one of the top 10 hot years uh, in, in, in history, but we only feel the pain of climate change when there's an event, maybe more uh, weather events or a drought that affects a certain region. So they're high momentum trends, but we only manage the small impacts. We're very reactionary. The changes may be irreversible. COVID may be a sign of an unhygienic or a, a socially consumptive society that won't survive through virus transmission if this is the beginning uh, of, of more viruses than just the COVID-19 uh, example that we have today. It definitely shows that regardless of the science of the virus or the causes of climate change that the people impacted often are affected more by social differences and spatial inequality than simply the threat of the virus or the impact of climate change. So, uh, and, and in both of these cases, there, there's a weakening of international solidarity. So our ability to respond to a crisis in, in, as an international society is good, uh, but climate change causes this long-term disagreement on who benefits, who doesn't benefit from climate change adaptation. And coronavirus, uh, similar example, but the fact that we're, we're not traveling and we're not connecting on an international level other than through screens uh, may be weakening an international solidarity. Maybe not, maybe it's linking it as well. Uh, but certainly they're less costly to prevent in the long run for our future and our future generations than they are to try to cure. And so I'm, for me personally, I, I, I can share that I'm very supportive of the, of the vaccine movement and what it's doing uh, right now, but you know, that is the emergency response to a longer term problem that we also need to invest in with the same concern that we have uh, when we choose to stay home, when the governments tell us, or we choose to, to get a trust and get a vaccine when we, when we need to. And there are, as I was saying, there are implications for this. There are great books out there and studies. This one is a geographer, Jared Diamond, who wrote about uh, collapse. He basically studied civilizations for most of his career and, and wanted to figure out, well, why do civilizations collapse? And in all of the cases that he looks at in these books is that despite the, the, the pandemics and the viruses and the, the incidences of, of uh, impact, it was the environmental degradation that led to the, uh, the collapse of that society. And usually the trends from that society were they didn't anticipate a problem. So they might've dealt with impacts, but they didn't anticipate what those impacts meant. So we have growing climate change, we have growing water crisis, we have a growing food crisis, we have a, a coronavirus pandemic. These are all unto themselves very important, but they're also signaling to us like our body will, something's going on at the root cause, something's going on with our overall health and how do we address these symptoms, which we need to, as well as set aside time, energy and money uh, to deal with the long-term impact, not just for ourselves and our families, but for, for a society and for a future, uh, that will look back on how we react to these moments. We also don't anticipate the severity of the problem. And already you see in some parts of the world that are vaccinated, a return to life, uh, which is a great feeling, I'm sure, but the, the concern about not picking up what we've learned and not understanding that we could be in this situation again. Um, or anticipating the problem and neglecting to address it. You know, there is a fight or flight response. Staying home and listening to uh, coronavirus orders or doing everything you can to reduce your impact on the environment are a way for people to feel like they're doing enough and they're doing something to deal with the risk. Just like anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers, climate change deniers, that's their way of coping 
with a risk is to say it doesn't exist. It's called cognitive dissonance. I'll just go back on with life and I won't have to think about this reality anymore. And, and so how do we learn to become a society that can face our long-term uh, future and face our long-term realities of being an organism on the planet uh, without you know, losing stimulation, freedoms, the desire to live in this world and engage in this world. So there is really good examples. You know, Easter Island would be the classic example of a society that cut all its trees down to use them as spiritual symbols. Uh, but as they cut the trees down and the environment around was being affected by the deforestation, nobody stopped to think that the trees should stop being cut until the last one was caught, cut and the civilization perished. So what is going on in our collective thinking when we don't respond to the obvious? So more lessons, uh, I think in the following ways, you know, any delays is costly. There's a recent report that came out uh, for the World Health Organization today that's sort of saying that the pandemic uh, could have been avoided altogether be because we didn't respond efficiently and effectively as a global society. Uh, again, a theoretical view that looks at certain actions that weren't taken. Uh, hindsight is always 2020, or it's easy to, to find faults, but just that awareness that in the next virus or the next major long-term issue, you know, how do we more uh, uh, in a solidarity move towards these solutions than divide ourselves uh, with disagreement? Uh, we really need to address uh, policy design and human judgment. Policy design is often based on science but human judgment uh, affects the view of why that policy is designed. Policymakers can't use human judgment, even though they might agree with the public. Uh, the, we have created systems and consumption base of systems that use science to extract resources, uh, to, to create surgeries and so forth. So that same science goes into policy design and we've come to rely on it. But maybe we don't understand that science, again, is just an indicator of what we need to do in uncertainty and nobody knows the answers moving forward. I'm sure if I was managing the pandemic, uh, I would be criticized just as much as world leaders are uh, today from making my own decisions in a complex situation. Certainly inequality uh, is a major factor in responding, you know, great knowledge held in people that just don't have the same advantage to bringing their voice to an international community or among uh, more affluent or richer nations. Uh, we need multiple forms, just like an ecosystem, just like that, that uh, Amazon rainforest creates a range of competitive and codependent and in interdependent relationships. Uh, international society needs to be able to function the same. Even disagreements can just be a blip into a larger agreement. And the transparency of normative positions is needed to navigate value judgments. So, you know, you look at vaccinations, you look at efforts to reduce climate change, the majority of the population is showing in statistics and surveys to be doing this. More people do recycle and uh, are conscious of climate change and their impacts than not. So, you know, where does this normative position, how is it always isolated away from uh, the view of the, the, the denying or the, the, the enticement of engaging in, in an argument with a dra drastically different opinion, which are, again, in part of, of, of debate. And then as a personal level, the things that I've really uh, uh, um, resonated with in, in our poll in a, in a second, we'll do the same to, re to resonate with you, but it forced us, you know, by maybe fear or maybe uh, concern for our family or concern for our society or concern that I want to do the right thing and just not always think about, you know, what I need to go out and do in the day. It radically changed us in a way that we're seeing a, a benefits the climate change movement. So why are we not uh, making the same efforts? And obviously it comes down to, you know, when you feel threatened, uh, you are much more prone to act. Uh, and as much as we don't want to create a society that feels threatened, we want to take on a behavior that we we're more concerned about things, issues that we now marginalize because it's off in the future. We can't prove it. Uh, it's not going to benefit me. So why should I reduce my driving? There's a, there's a different value system in doing that that leads to stimulation. So we, we have adapt shown that we could adapt to a rapidly changing world through COVID. We showed that people uh, can figure out how to keep some of their businesses. I know that businesses are suffering, but there are ingenious ways of, 
uh, business is still surviving without the same consumptive behavior as before. We fly less, we dry less, we use office space less, we use less resources getting ready in the morning and getting to work. Um, the, the interaction between energy, water, and food, which has always been a key to reducing global impacts, linking those three sectors and, and showing that they're both uh, intimately tied has been proven through staying at home and, and, and saving on water, energy, and food purchasing alone to buffer ourselves to the future. Uh, we, I can speak personally, at least from the people around me, and, and science is starting to show this too, uh, a, a total lack of sickness. I've got four kids, and we usually are sick every month with the flu. Uh, not one of us has been sick in the last year. Uh, sanitation, hygiene, our contemplative aspects of how we were engaging in society, not that we don't want to go out and be close and connected, uh, but contemplative of a growing population and, and, and hygiene importance. Maybe the most critical thing, being bored, forced to be being bored to the point where you had to learn new behaviors, you had to find interesting things to do, you had to find new value in your friends and family, uh, uh, and you had to find value in nature. These are all part of building stimulation, chemical release for things that are also harm harmonious with reducing the, the spread of viruses and reducing the impact on the planet. And a lot of people in my community are when are going out and growing gardens and going out and looking at spaces in the community that they want to improve and re-greening them or creating habitat. And this isn't just important pastimes, but it's part of that theory that the more we invite nature back into our lives, the more we do buffer ourselves from uncertain impacts from a very sterile human environment, whether it be climate change and environmental impacts or hygiene, uh, virus transmission and so on. So the key to transferring these habits to post-pandemic world is to anticipate other concerns. We don't want to scare ourselves, but we want to be real with what the planet will look like in 20, 40, 80, 100 years, and so on, and allow that to inform our, our adaptive benefit. If my great grandchildren are going to be affected by air pollution, then I may value my every day of reducing my air, air quality impact. So let's hear from you. I know the poll's already going here, but I'm just curious. This is, a, again, just to see what, what people you can, I think you can choose a few here, uh, but which of the following habits, behaviors are you most likely to adapt in your long-term actions? And I, right away, I'm glad to see that there's, a, there's at least uh, every, every one of the, these important uh, behavioral patterns is, uh, is, is getting some credit here. Um, but we can sell just go through the, the the list while we're waiting for the poll to close certainly buying local using local energy and, and having connection with local people who are responsible for products. Uh, allows us to be diverse allows us to you know I know, for me, I spend more. Um, uh, buying local because I know it's going to help people uh, that are affected by the pandemic, but it also breeds uh, that local business then supports a, a, a community kids program uh, and there's just much more. Um, diversity linked and connected like an ecosystem versus you know being divided by box stores or suburbs or large uh, corporations corporate brands uh, where we don't feel that same connection and local consumers usually have better environmental qualities because they want to promote that less traveling certainly uh, 44 percent up uh, getting up there less driving i know in my case um, working from home i think a lot of businesses are realizing that you know, to, to return to the office has to be very logical. You know, if people are, are working from home, um, a return to the office might provide more freedoms and flexibility for people to work at home and create a more trusting relationship within business and employees while still maintaining office space for, for certain roles. Uh, spending time outside seems to be getting uh, more with more people. You know, in my case, I, I was always outside quite a bit because of my job uh, and so on. I found for me, uh, the pandemic, staying home, taking care of four kids and homeschooling, I've stayed inside a bit more than I would have liked to. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a comfort, a, a creepy comfort, not a, a healthy one for me, but uh, you know, there is that aspect that sometimes coping with these, these types of issues or a pandemic is staying home, but we need to also, I think, consider that these restrictions or this way of living may not end in the short term. So you know, holding up until the, the end may, may not be a, a, the best adaptive response also. Lots of people still wearing their mask regardless. 
uh, and practicing a better hygiene. I like that one. And that, that is a very, I mean, public health officials in every nation have been trying to promote that through laws, through education and so forth. It's a, it's a very well known in the public health uh, world uh, that we, we do encounter a tremendous amount of, uh, of things in our daily lives, especially consumptive. And it's not just as simple as they're good immune boosters. We have more people, we have more interaction in different ways. And so uh, hygiene seems to be something that I think will benefit us in many, many ways. So the poll is closed. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm glad to see that there's so much participation at poll and lots of variety and, and still all the answers were selected, whether they're a little less selected or a little more selected. It's great to see. So I'll pass back to you for that last slide. We have yeah. So that I just put up a couple things here that I might have brought up. Um, I know we talked about the melting glaciers and ancient viruses, uh, so not everything I mentioned here, but again, if we if we move forward, you know, uh, how do we how do we take the lessons and, and, and do something uh, and consider the whole uh, more than the, than the immediate emergency. So, you know, something like melting glaciers is a good example of why we should still maintain our concern. It's good to be concerned. It's good to be cautious. Uh, not in a sense that affects our well-being, uh, but to be uh, mature and face the world that we live in. Uh, so, you know, melt the, the concept of future viruses lets us say, well, hey, let's be careful right now. Let's keep moving forward carefully and know that we're, we're being risk averse. You know, we need to uh, adapt to reducing transmission that we talked about, better hygiene. Certainly air quality improvements would benefit us, benefit us across the, 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 the board, but COVID uh, management or COVID mitigation uh, has, is starting to be strongly proven to be related to air quality. Um, carbon emissions, as I've mentioned, uh, rewilding space, social ecological justice really speaks to uh, that dynamic of not just equity, um, and, and reducing marginalization, but the links between the health of the economy and the health of our society, increasing diversity and, and, and creating natural spaces that are diverse to a number of different uh, species or interactions allows us to reduce the dominance of certain things like a, a bacteria or a virus. Some form of economic conformity, certainly the disparities between the rich and the poor in the world are driving this division in how to respond to problems that may or may not affect some parts of the population over the others. You know, how do we, I don't know if I should use the word crisis, but how do we continue to address these issues and then also honor them as indicators? You know, often disease in the body manifests through lesions or through symptoms. And we deal with those symptoms and we take medication for those symptoms and we forget about the lifestyle patterns or the, the in general environmental conditions that are causing our, our, our degradation to our body. How do we look at the planet in the same way um, and become more adaptive and living under uncertainty and trust? And if we can see that the world is complex and uncertain, which many cultures do, maybe not the West as much, uh, but many cultures live in a world where they know that life is uncertain and there's a different value for it. And there's a different cautious way of entering a world that you want to be careful in. So changing norms, behavior, you know, maybe for lack of a better word, sacrifice or reducing our needs uh, through less consumption, psychological health and well-being. And, the, you know, the final thing I'll say is just that focus as young people on what our role is. I can still consider myself a young person in the sense of population in general. And, you know, the one thing I've learned from traditional cultures is not only looking generationally and being cautious, but you take care of your young and you take care of your old, not just because it's an important value system, but because just like a herd of animals, uh, if you can take care of your young and old, then everyone in between does that much better. And through climate change, long-term climate change and virus planning, you know, this view that the old and the young or the sick and the vulnerable aren't, are, you know, are the only ones that are going to be affected and therefore I don't need to act is, is sort of a norm and I think a value system I would personally like to see uh, for, the, for the health and well-being of the planet. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll open uh, up to more questions and for Jordan to moderate. And I just wanted to thank you uh, very much for, for hearing my voice and listening to some of the things I had to say. Awesome. Well, well thank you so much for your time. Today's presentation and, and lecture has been uh, really eye-opening for myself and for many viewers, I'm sure. Uh, we do have a few questions in the queue and then we will have to wrap it up just acknowledging we're just past 10 o'clock here. Um, the first one is said, uh, I'm interested in climate modeling. How can I start from the beginning? 
Well, we do have a climate modeler in our department. His name's Dr. Ann, uh, Adam Cornwall. Uh, he's in the Department of Geography at Lakehead University. Uh, and he trained under one of the leading modelers from the University of Toronto. So there's a good opportunity to, to work on that in many places, but Lakehead does have uh, that ability. And climate modeling uh, is something that obviously once you start learning about climatology first, so we, we have a course at Lakehead in first and second year that teaches you about climate, uh, climatology, those variables, humidity, temperature. Uh, and then you it, it becomes a very computer driven process. Climate modeling is very much based on knowing those climate parameters, but knowing how to interact with computer models to create scenarios. So that's something in your undergrad you'd want to learn about. Uh, and try out working with profs, certainly at your at a graduate level, I, I think is where you would have enough skill to actually be part of that modeling process beyond just learning about it and, and actually applying it to different areas. What we need out of climate models now are regional models. We have great models that show how countries might change or large parts of the earth might change, uh, but we need now to, to keep working on those models and start to hone them in on larger eco or smaller ecosystems or states or provinces or counties uh, or districts. Uh, and that provides us with much more practical information because that's where decision makers are. But come on into your undergrad. Uh, that, that's the place to start doing something like climatology, which is a topic within geography. Awesome. Another, we have two questions that are, are semi-related. The first one is, are there any diseases which are dormant for many years but could be activated in our future? And the second question that's related is, are there any risk for other disease other than COVID? Yeah, I, I think with the these ancient viruses, there still is the potential. It's not like they're dead or dormant. They're part of an ecosystem that had certain conditions that allowed them to exist. So in addition to them uh, um, coming into our interaction and on the planet, you still need that changing environment to create the conditions that exist. Uh, I'm trying to think of some around here. There are some, like there's a, something called West Nile virus here in Canada, and that was a, a virus that was dormant in this region because of the cold uh, and, beca and because it was transmitted through mosquitoes uh, that would then be killed off at the end of the summer when it got really freezing cold. And the increase in warming has allowed for mosquitoes to exist for larger parts of the year. And the West Nile virus, which was always sort of being transmitted at a very small rate, was now noticeable among the population to the point where health officials started educating and warning people about, you know, wearing uh, things to close and stuff to reduce uh, from mosquito bites, much like you would see in malaria countries, which isn't a common thing in Canada. We're worried about mosquitoes because they're annoying, but we rarely worry about them for viruses. So that might be a pathway that's more logical than just uh, the disease itself, but certainly waterborne illnesses, there's the ability for bacteria to grow in water is, is largely temperature dependent. Uh, so for areas that have cold water systems that are warming, uh, again, that's a pathway that allows for the interaction between viruses and humans more. Awesome. And the final question we have is actually from one of our own panelists here behind the scenes. It said, um, in your opinion, what environmental legislation and or regulation should Canada and, and countries around the world implement or introduce after COVID-19 that is going to help climate change? Well, I, I think the word uh, global change is the one we need to look at more. We focus on climate because we notice the indications of CO2, but there are certainly changes in nitrogen throughout the planet. Nitrogen, which is a key uh, nutrient for growth that we're using in fertilizers or we're reducing where it's being stored in the oceans and, and adding it to water bodies through runoff. Uh, so when, when I say global change, there's a number uh, of factors that we need to start addressing first. Um, this, the second thing I'll say is, as an analogy, when it comes to climate change and CO2, if I can put all of those types of uh, global change chemicals into the same category as CO2, you know, right now we're trying to reduce emissions. Uh, and, and certainly we showed through COVID that we actually reduced emissions almost 30%. We hit targets that were uh, aimed for back in the 1990s that, the, that society could never achieve. Uh, and within you know, half a year of the global pandemic, we reduced CO2 to those levels. However, you know, the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere already uh, doesn't affect climate change as much. It's just our emissions level. So I guess getting back to your question, we really have to stop playing around with these 
uh, economic drivers, the cap and trade, the ways of, of skirting the reality of reducing emissions with shifting who emits around the, the, the planet or the country. Uh, so areas that have lower emissions get more money and places that have higher emissions uh, get less money. And, and there's not really any uh, mature way of just simply saying, we need to reduce the emissions, we need strong emission reduction targets, uh, and then we'll have to work with all of the people that that affect, of course. Uh, but that's what we did in, in COVID. You know, we created restrictions, uh, and there were a lot of people that suffered from those restrictions, and, and they may still suffer from it. Um, and so it's a hard call to make, but simply actu actually reducing the tonnage of emissions in the atmosphere without carbon trading, without capping, in my view, uh, is, is the least amount of effort that we need to make in the long term. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to uh, share my slideshow just quickly so I can sort of wrap it up and remind our viewers, I, I encourage you to follow us and stay connected on our social media channels. You can find us at Lakehead International, both on Facebook and Instagram. Our main YouTube channel is Lakehead University. We have multiple international specific playlists. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to also explore our campuses, so check out our Thunder Bay campus or our Aurelia campus, you can head over to lakehead.ca forward slash tours and take that virtual campus tour. Um, once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I apologize if we weren't able to get to your question or answer it today. Um, but thank you to Dr. Robert Stewart for the lecture. I really appreciate your time and, uh, and sharing your insight with the audience. And thank you to our audience, whether it was your morning, your afternoon, or your late evening. Um, we appreciate your attendance and, and continued support. And of course, our behind the scenes teams. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do this session without you. So with that being said, uh, thank you again for joining us, folks, and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Thank you for checking out today's video. If you have any questions, you can always comment below. Stay connected and follow us on our social media channels to stay informed about upcoming webinars and get an insider sneak peek of Lakehead University. See you next time.